Hey, everybody in Facebook world, across the world. I am so excited to be um, with you today and to have my great friend, Dr. Steve Silk, with me. Um, gosh, I think we've known each other. I remember going to my first CAC in, um, with Dr. Chuck Barrington. Hey, Chuck. Um, oh, gosh, early 2000s, maybe? Mm -hmm. Ooh, I don't I think know. We met, we met at Parker. I think you may have even still been at school. Oh my gosh. Yeah, that was a long time ago. So needless to say, Dr. Steve and I have a long history together and he is just a, an amazing guy with a gigantic heart. Um, he also practices with his wife. We're going to get to that in just a few minutes. So the first thing I want to start with, and, and just to remind all of you, um, if you do post below, we do want to see your comments and your questions, so please do post below. If you don't want them to show up, though, message me, okay? Facebook message me so that, and just say, hey, Barbara, I don't want you to show mine, because remember, when I show it, it pops up right there where it says, right now, Drs. Barbara Eaton and Stephen Silk, your question and your name will pop up. But we do want to be interactive, so please feel free to... Um, ask any questions and write any comments. So the very first thing we all want to know, Dr. Steven, is what prompted you to become a chiropractor? I, I have, it's a bit of a long story, so I'll try to encapsulate it best I can. Uh, when I was 12, I had an earache that wouldn't go away. And of course, mom took me down to the local physician, put me on penicillin, and I had a severe job, prompt the need for uh, uh, emergency intervention as well. Uh, with uh, prednisone because I had an anaphylactic reaction. Then uh, after five or six or seven rounds of antibiotics, my grandmother, who was living with us at the time, uh, came into my room one night and said, are you done messing about with these people? No, that's not the words she used, but <laughs> it's just a little horrible at that point in her life. <clears throat> and uh, she did a home remedy where she put a, uh, uh, she iron, uh, ironed a, a small pillowcase that she rolled up and kept putting it on, the, on my ear and the side of my neck for six night period, the, the earache went away. Uh, we went back to the physician and uh, he triumphantly announced that the drugs had finally kicked in and uh, he was successfully treated my ear infection, which probably was not an infection at all. Uh, more of a blocked eustachian tube, as most uh, that are listening probably recognize right away. And uh, even at 12, I knew that's not right. No, the, the drugs did not finally kick in. And I said, it was something my grandmother did. And he said, well, the grand, what your grandmother did may have made you feel better, but the drugs are why you got better. And uh, I was like, I didn't accept that. I didn't buy that. I didn't buy more shit. So uh, I remember asking anyone in, the, in a health-related profession uh, how that worked. And even the local vet, the local veterinarian said the same thing, is that the drugs finally kicked in. And then Three or four years later, three years later, I was at a father and son night for the Masonic Lodge and uh, a local chiropractor um, explained to me that what my grandmother did had stimulated my body's innate capacity for recovery. And I'm like, OK, that that starts to sound a little bit better. OK, tell me more. And he said, well, let's not do that here. Let's do it in my office. I went to his office the next morning. He explained uh, vitalism, innate philosophy, how chiropractic worked, how the body worked. And I was in, sold. And uh, here I am 30 odd years later. Uh, doing it and loving it in that practice i am back in the practice i started in as a patient in 1978 i moved home and, and uh, purchased that practice and uh, here we are wow 1978 you must have started practicing when like you were three <laughs> well i started as a patient in 78 uh, but I, I i bought uh, sorry my ear, earbud keeps coming out i apologize if that's distracting oh that's okay um i bought the practice my wife and i purchased uh, my my initial patient experience practice uh, in 1995 is when I moved home. And you went to chiropractic college where? Uh, I started at CMCC in Toronto, at, uh, made some wonderful friends, but I did not find it to be a, a, a chiropractic experience the way I understood because I had chiropractic explained to me. I bought the philosophy first before I bought the uh, the intervention. And uh, it was just too mechanical, too, too limited. And I, said I, I ended up going to Life West in the San Francisco Bay Area and um, would highly recommend it. I'm, I, I'm just, in fact, I enjoyed my experience so much. I'm now on the board of regents for Life West and uh, moving awesome. it forward. That's awesome. And, and Dr. Steven definitely is one of those chiropractors who gives back and helps in every way he can. And one of the ways that he gives back and helps our profession is with CAC. So let's, I guess, let's just jump right there. What is CAC and how did you get involved and what's it about? 
All right. So uh, you're inquiring about the Chiropractic Awareness Council of Ontario, who is recently they're in the process of rebranding themselves as the Alliance for Chiropractic. I am now the past chairman of the board. And uh, it's it's basically the vitalistic or, or, or you know, if you really want to get down with a straight uh, chiropractic uh, membership organization in the province of Ontario. And um, we, we stand for the basic principles that built this profession from one lone man in a small office in the Ryan building in Davenport, Iowa. It's the largest non-allopathic profession on the planet. And we're, we're, we stick to those vitalistic principles. They're as good today as they were in 1895. And, and, and we see that it's eroding as there's a selling out to the lowest common denominator, I guess, to, for self-worth or maybe a few dollars. And we're just like, we're standing up and saying, no, this is not acceptable. And we're prepared to do what it takes to ensure that chiropractic as we know it and we understand it and we practice it is alive and well in the province of Ontario 30, 50, 100 years from now. So, so do you have that same struggle in, um, in Canada? I kind of know this answer, but just for everyone watching, um, between like straight and mixers and, and we mean no offense to anybody, but obviously if you look at the, the, um, the body as a self healing organism, as you know, above, down, inside out, as an intelligence <laughs> on the job, as subluxation. Yes, I said subluxation for I think it's the past president, the ACA said that we need to get away with that word. It's not going anywhere. Um, I I'm intend with to, you. <laughs> I intend to use it for my entire life. So just so on that. Um, but Let's talk about vitalism versus mixers in, in Canada and, and how you see those similarities um, in the U.S. And then we're going to move into what does that have to do with owning the principle and being successful in practice? So let's first start with vitalism alive and well in Canada. Vitalism, yeah. So I, I see, you know, the, the old terms, it was straight and mixer. But I think even in those days, okay, sorry about that ear, but. Uh, even in those days, they still had a common consciousness. It was less mechanical back in the 30s. It was more the way you expressed the interaction of vitalism in the 20s, 30s, and 40s when the mixer is straight. So I think it's gone beyond that. It's beyond straight mixer. It's vitalism mechanism. And so there is that you know challenge within the profession. There's some that see chiropractic as a therapeutic mechanical intervention for an acute spine care syndrome. And then there's those of us that see, well, no, you know, there's way more to it. There's there's a component of that, but you know, there's way more to it. There's way more to it. So yes, there's the, those who practice vitalism. It, it's probably well over sixty percent of the profession, in the, in, and I can only speak to Ontario. It's not so much the rest of the, the profession, the rest of the country, but sixty um, percent of the profession has an affinity for uh, classic traditional values of chiropractic. The body is self-healing there is an innate intelligence in us and that when we touch someone it activates that innate awareness of self and the body does the job it was designed to do um we tend not to be as noisy as the mechanists on a lot of levels so we don't rise to positions of power whether it be regulatory boards or membership organizations or research agendas and therefore uh, the folks that are doing that tend to be moving forward in a, a mechanical model and trying to move us more as a, a, a medical subspecialty, which which I think is a, is a will be the death now of chiropractic if we become a medical subspecialty. I have no problems working with a medical doctor, but I don't want yeah. to work within his model because what their model thrives at is crisis intervention, heart attack, strokes, broken bones, lacerations, severe burns, shark bites. Um, we 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 really suck at that. We we're no good at crisis intervention, and there are some that think we are, but you know we aren't. Um, but if we stick to our guns and stay in our own lane and 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 recognize our forte is not life threatening, it's quality of life threatening. We'll do just fine. We'll help a lot of people. We'll make some decent money. And all go to bed when we've been uh, been able to help humanity uh, live their life at a better level. Yeah, and you know, I think it's exciting to see the the changes and trends in at least wise in the culture in the United States. And I assume, I mean, you guys aren't really that much different. Well. Kind of in some ways a lot different, but you know what I mean. Um, we can that, go down that rabbit hole because we can do that. <laughs> That'll be half an hour. Um, the shift. I, remember, to, I promise rabbit holes and taboo. <laughs> that's right. Um, the shift to um, natural living, whether it's you know non-GMO foods or it's be careful of what you're putting on your skin, be careful what you're breathing in. 
be mindful of your, you know, trauma thoughts and toxins is that like the culture is moving to that in, in large waves. And so I think it's, it's incredibly interesting that there are those who call themselves chiropractors that while society is moving closer to our philosophy, they're running in the opposite direction. And it just forever, if ever there was a great time to be a chiropractor, it's right now. It's right now with the terrible situation with Obamacare and the United States and the gigantic, you know, premiums and, and less coverage where people are saying, you know what, to be healthy, I recognize I have to take my, my, my health in my own hands and I'm paying out of pocket. And then the, the trends towards natural living, it, it's a great time chiropractor. If you're, if you're considering like moving on or, or changing, changing to medi practice or whatever it happens to be, please don't like reach out to, to Dr. Steve or I, um, and we'll be more than happy to spend whatever, whatever time that you need on the phone so that you truly own chiropractic. So let's talk about owning chiropractic. Tell um, tell everyone else that story that you told me last night. Oh, uh, we, we covered a couple of things last night. Which which one? The which about one are you branding. In? Oh, branding. Yeah. Um, I think it's important that we get very clear on what it is we're selling, and if you clearly explain to people that enter your office that what you do is different, that I, I have no problems telling people what I do is 180 degrees different from the medical model of care. I'm not trying to mimic or or, or be an alternative to a medical intervent, uh, intervention, what I do is unique and different. And, it, and, and it's also 90 degrees different from what a lot of my colleagues in the area are doing. And as such, because I set a specific brand and a specific way of analyzing people, a specific way of, of caring and adjusting for people, we draw folks from a, a, a long way away. This, this morning, I had two families come in from a town that's an, an hour and a half away. They drive by 27 chiropractors to come to my office won't drive the opposite direction because what I do is dramatically different. I'm not suggesting it's necessarily better, um, but it is different. And when you are clear on your brand and clear on what it is you're delivering and you look at someone right in the eye and tell them, this is what I can do for you, and you own it within a short period of time, most of them will own it. And not everyone. There are folks that come into our office and they see yeah. us as a short-term intervention for whatever their condition or their, or their, or their concern is. And, and that's their business. That's, I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. But because I laid all out in my consultation, here is who I am and here is what I do. We have extremely high PVA because people come in and they tend to stay in. And I think by setting and being clear in that brand, if more of our profession was clear on understanding our brand and then getting good at selling our brand, we do just fine. And I think the, 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 the little story we're talking about is uh, there's a high rate of practitioner uh, burnout and bailing in this province uh in so in um the the city of windsor ontario which is the an, uh, equivalent of detroit it's right across the border actually from detroit um <laughs> they have a very high rate of practitioners that, that aren't succeeding in practice and are bailing but one of those gentlemen uh failed in practice he was a graduate of the college in toronto um but he went to work for a mercedes-benz dealership and he was the highest selling auto salesman in the GM, Ford, and Chrysler town selling a German model. But he had faith and understanding and belief in what he was selling. And he was able to rip the market a new one in a town that he should have failed in his brand and he owned the product and he owed his confidence. And so once you have that confidence in your brand and what you can deliver, you can be the top selling uh, practitioner in your market too. I honestly believe that. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, what's interesting is, is that gentleman was selling something that's completely non-essential. It's not like anyone yes. needs a Mercedes. It's, it's a total luxury item. That's non-essential. They could buy, you know, a, a smart car to get them from point A to point B and spend mm -hmm. whatever 12 grand instead of 120 grand. Um, so what a shame that, that despite having these phenomenal skills, which if any of you see my post today, get over it. Not one single transaction in business or penny has ever been made in any business without a sale. So like it or not, Mr. and Mrs. Chiropractor, you are salespeople. And I highly, highly, highly advise that if you don't like talking about money or you don't like sales, that you pay close attention to an eight-week 
um, boot camp that I'm about to release that will help you make that transition. So, Steve, let's let's so we're talk all sorry, about. Brother, Barb, I just want to add to that. We we are all selling something. Everybody in life yes. sells something. We yes. sell a higher quality of life. That's what we sell. But ultimately, what we all sell is a relationship. And yeah. I, I'm up front with people at the consultation. I want to create a lifetime relationship with you. And if, if what I'm selling is something you're willing to buy and invest in, which is yourself, you're going to have an awesome experience. And again, that's but that comes to getting very clear and understanding what your brand is and owning your brand so that you're able to sell it like the Mercedes dealership in uh, the, the, you know, Canadian version of Detroit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's that's beautiful. Like right up front. My intention is to have a long term relationship with you and to support you and care for you and, and teach you what I can to help you live an amazing life and experience your optimum potential. I mean, if you know anyone watching, if you have a problem with that, like, please reach out. We would love to help you and um, and, and just help you see that you're you're not selling yourself. You're not even selling chiropractic. You're selling individuals on themselves. And, you know, like even when you're dating. You're selling yourself to that person in hopes that yeah. they'll date you or they'll marry you or whatever it happens to be when, you know, like, which is a relationship, you know, which is a relationship. relationship. Everything you do involves that. And, and likely you're being sold on a regular basis and you don't even know it. So, um, anyway, so let's talk about this issue. Husband, wife practice. How do you do that? Uh, it's one of the most rewarding things I can imagine. It's one of the yeah. most challenging things I can imagine. Um, because not only is she my business partner, she's my life partner. And, yeah. uh, you know, so because we're human beings, even though we have a very similar compass pointing north as far as our beliefs and our worldview, how we express that worldview is different. And so it can be challenging when I might want to do a particular procedure a certain way, but she disagrees. Well, if they're listening to the broadcast, when the, when the wife says no, the answer is no. Um, but it is extremely rewarding because I have my chiropractor is in my my my, my practice with me. Um, there are people that are drawn to her because of her her personality, and particular skill set, because of the relationship she creates that won't see me when she's away. If she goes down to California to visit her mother, she's Californian, by the way. If she goes to visit her mother, there are people that just will not see me while she's gone and, and vice versa. And I'm okay with that because we have to we create those relationships. As you said about dating, um, not everyone you date is somebody you settle down with. Sometimes it doesn't go past the first date. And I'm, and I'm totally, and once you're cool and okay with that, um, I think it makes it a lot easier in a husband wife relationship is that you can offer a lot more because of the variation in styles and, 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 and skill sets to the people of your community. So there's less people falling out the back door. So if someone doesn't connect to me or doesn't respond to what my care might entail, I can encourage them. Why don't you just let my wife uh, interact and adjust you for a short period of time and see how you respond to her. And so it's really well. So, so I know when we talked about yesterday too, um, your practice, your husband, wife practice, it's not that it's just like, interchangeable and when someone comes in they see like whoever is available no, you have no, two distinct practices can you talk about like how have you made that work um because i i find that that's a, a huge i coach lots of of husbands and wives together over the years and obviously i was in practice well he didn't really practice a whole, whole lot but anyway technically um mm -hmm. in, in practice with with my now ex-husband um and we had it where like whoever came in, like they had their favorites, but it, it wasn't a, his practice, my practice. It was a whole thing. But when we talked yeah. yesterday, it was, you, you guys have set it up much more of a, yeah. these are Dr. Stevens, right? And so on. Right? Yeah. Uh, my wife, Raylan and, and myself, yeah. we right at the gate, when we bought the, uh, the existing practice of, of my initial chiropractor, original chiropractor we agreed that we would have separate practices within one building so we have the same ca uh, same paperwork um same filing system same everything except it's just two separate practices in one building and we just felt that for us that would work best and we've and over the you know the 22 years i've been home uh it's it's worked out phenomenally well and so do you have but like the same i don't know if you guys have home. the same um like federal id number is it the same business 
that that yeah, yeah it's under it's under one business okay and we're, we're we're basically we're both employees of our business okay okay um and how do you handle you know i think in a lot of marriages there's like that competition or when doctors are in practice you know, when it's two chiropractors, even if they have separate practices, it becomes this competition of like, who mm-hmm. sees more or who has more new practice members or who makes more like, have you and Ray Lynn like faced that? And if you have, how have you overcome? And I know both of your heart. So I'm kind of guessing that if she did better, you would be like, woohoo, you know, and when you do better, she's like, way to go, babe. Um, well, and but, yeah, that's a good question, because um, for those that know my wife, she's she's a competitive type person. Um, so I'm, I'm sure that at some level there is a degree of, I wish I was doing better, but I think it spurs both of us on to provide, provide more for the people we see. Um, we're, we're, we're referral based practice. We do no external advertising. We, we don't do screenings. We don't do mailers. We don't, I mean, I and mean, this is part of, you know, maturation and practice. We don't have to, but even early on, we didn't do a lot of external stuff where it became fighting over the same group of people. And, and, and with yeah. the colleagues in the area, I don't feel I'm fighting with them for That's right. patients. There's tons of people out there that need our care. And because we don't focus um, in a mechanical model, the po- folks that are uh, looking for uh, ankle taping, there's a practitioner's forte. And so that they will be drawn to him. Yeah. Um, so it's not really, It's I don't think it's ever been really competitive other than amongst our, uh, me amongst myself and she amongst herself and trying to just be the best we can and do the best we can for the people we serve. Right on. And, um, and it is so much about just providing value. Now, for those listening who may be tempted to think, well, I provide value, but yet, and, and that doesn't mean we give it away for free. That doesn't mean that you're not in business and it's your responsibility to make sure that there's an even exchange for the majority of your practice members. We're going to get to just a couple of minutes, um, the idea of benevolence in our practices sure. as well. But you, but you have to make sure that there is a, an even exchange between the services that are provided and what you're receiving back. And just Absolutely. because it's still- well, we have to be profitable. I mean, in order, in order to really thrive and, you know, save the world for- you know, on a lot of levels, that's where we, we, our time has come. But in order to be able to, to do that, you have to be able to keep your doors open. You have to be able to pay all your bills, you both at the clinic and at home, and have some money left over for when you retire. And that's, that's right. just a reality, you know. Yep. But as you said, there are – do you want to get into the benevolence thing now? Yeah, or do you want to, yeah let's do that. Okay, so, I mean, the, the reality is there, there are people that will come to any of us who are in dire straits. Now, I practice in a town of 2,100. Uh, it's not people that in this area, or at least know of them. So I know the folks that are that are hanging on by their fingernails that need help. And so there are there's a family just up the street from us, wonderful uh, family, and uh, they've got a really really special rate. They probably as a family pay as much for the entire family to come in as most people pay for themselves. Because that family, if it weren't for me re- dramatically reducing my fee, they wouldn't be able to receive care. That's just their situation. The town I live in has a median income of twenty-three thousand uh, dollars. It's not a well-off community by okay. any stretch of the means. But I consciously chose to come home. Um, I, I decided to do that um, at possibly my financial detriment. But that, I mean, I'm not. A, I don't need a, a Mercedes in the in the laneway. I don't need a sailboat in the harbor, even though we have a beautiful harbor. Okay, 15 foot aluminum with a 20 horse putt putt motor to get me around. I don't, I don't need the yacht. This is not who I am. So, um, and my vision is bigger than just myself and my pocketbook. It's for my my community. I, I moved home for a reason, and and it works out because you know those folks are extremely um, thankful and and appreciative. Um, and there's people in my practice that know right well that there are some folks getting special deals, but they don't make a big deal about it. They wreck because again, they know these people too. They know that the only reason this couple can bring in their four kids, they're doing the math in their heads. They're like, there's no way they could afford that. So they know it. And that only adds to the vibe that we're trying to create in our office, a loving community 
uh, a sense, uh, and we want people feeling they're belonging to to a tribe that we're trying to create. And, and I, th I think it's working fairly well because we're doing pretty. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So, hey, so let's talk about though how how do you establish that break point of this is the 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 amount of benevolence that I can have because you and I both know there are a lot of chiropractors who serve themselves broke um yeah. or who are so let's first talk about that and then before we move on I want to talk about in an economically depressed area how um what, um, cause, cause I know there's several people who are going to watch this who are also in economically depressed areas mm -hmm. and they struggle with, um, being able to p package their services for individuals who just like don't really have any money. Um, mm -hmm. so let, let's first talk about what is the break even Lynn, or what, how do you establish what percent of your practice then can be? in that benevolence group and how long can someone stay in that group, you know, like that, all of those things so that I, I want to just make sure that anyone watching this doesn't go away and say, Oh, well, you know, Dr. Barbara and Dr. Stevens said it, it's fine to make it, uh, a, you know, the same price for a family as it is for an individual. We're, we're not saying that as a not general rule. No. Okay. So go ahead. Um, so, when I first, when we first started in the practice here in town, I didn't track it. I didn't think about it. I just gave from my heart. I just said, this is what I want to do. And this is what I'm giving. Uh, probably about third or fourth year in practice, as we started to pay off and pay down some of our debt, I started actually looking at that number and it was pretty stable over that period of time at around 12%. And I thought that's interesting. I can remember as a child, I, I dated a girl when I was in high school who uh, came from a Roman Catholic uh, background. And her dad was very, very active in, in, in the church and not just in the town, but in Providence was very firm in that the, as, a, as a good Catholic, they had to tithe back 15% of their income. Mm -hmm. And so like 25 years later, I'm going, geez, that's not too far off what I'm giving back to my community at 12%. And it really, over the last 20, 20 odd years, it, it hovers between 12 and 15%. Perfect. But it wasn't a conscious thing where I've got, okay, I've hit my 15%, I'm done. It just has worked out that way. And, you know, there's a universal intelligence inherent in all matter, and it's inherent in our relationships, too. And so it's just, it's worked itself out. Um, because I've, we've decided we have a certain profit margin we want to meet. And so when we sit down with our account at the end of the year, have we met that? Yes or no? And, and if I go two years in a row where I have not met that profit margin, we raise our fees, $2. And we've only had to do that twice since 1995. That's awesome. Because we're able, to, we're able to serve a high enough volume of people that our profit margin is better every year. So I don't yeah. have to raise my fees. In fact, we have some of the lowest fees in uh, in Bruce County, which I'm practicing, not because I devalue what I do. It's just I'm able to create enough profit for myself that I don't need to charge the most money, even though my ego says I'm worth it. That's right. Yeah, that's awesome. And And so keep your overhead personally and professionally underfoot. And then, then you have a lot more control over who who you can be benevolent to as yeah. well. Um, the the fees that you that you do charge. If you can't afford your own fees, you need to kind of start taking a look at what's Absolutely. going on in your personal and your professional life. So then the Absolutely. next part that we were talking about. So we were, did benevolence. There was a second part to that. I should have written it down. Oh, and we were talking about the percentage of insurance coverage too. Oh, right there. Yeah, about insurance coverage. So oh, it went away. In, yeah. in my so in, in our town, you take? Uh, we take zero insurance. <laughs> we, we we don't yeah. bill at any insurance company, um, and the we we just and we don't attract a lot of motor vehicle claims. We you know maybe one every two or three years. We don't attract workers' comp claims, but even in cases like that, we tell the patient you will need to pay us. And then you can approach the insurer or whoever your third part, Uncle John, for all we know. It doesn't really matter to me. My, my financial relationship is with you. And, uh, and, and less than 10% of our practice have access to secondary insurance. Now, there are practices, especially in larger urban centers where there's a lot of uh, industry, have upwards of 90% of their patient base have some degree of secondary insurance. Um, 
we're no longer in the uh, Ontario provincial uh, medical payment plan, which suits me just fine. It was ridiculously small yeah. amount of money anyway. Yeah. <laughs> it worked out to a, a, like a case of beer a month is what they were giving us. Yeah. That, was, that was a crap beer, not even the good stuff, right? Yeah, that's right. That was the American and beer. So, <laughs> now there's crappy Canadian beer. Don't let the Canadian ego about how great our beer is, because you know what? A lot of Canadian beer is not that great. Oh, uh, I'm not really that much of a beer drinker, so I don't really know. But I've just heard stories. All right, so so let's talk since um since we're on the topic of insurance, and I found this really interesting yesterday. The uh, the whole socialized medicine that hopefully by God's grace Donald Trump is going to help uh, America pull itself out of. Let's talk real quickly how awesome that's been um, for you as a Canadian citizen. So and the, the average Canadian thinks our, our uh, they call it a healthcare system, but <laughs> our, our, our healthcare parameters are, are going downhill very, very quickly. So I don't think it's yeah. health. Yeah. Um, but the medical pay system, when I moved home from uh, California in 1991, the uh, medical health insurance paid through the government was 19 cents on every tax dollar I sent in. It is now 51 cents on every tax dollar I send in. And at current growth trends, it will be 100% of the tax dollars I send to my government by 2030. That means no more police, no more snow plows, no more jails, no more schools, no more nothing but hospitals and physicians. And it's just <laughs> unsustainable. So either we pay way more taxes and, uh, you know, if you guys took a look at the overall tax rate in, in, in the province of Ontario, you'd, you'd have a batch of kittens. Um, <laughs> I'm, trying to, I'm trying to be polite. In the it's, it's an outrageous the amount of money we spend on taxes. So either we pay more taxes or we do with less services, which is coming down the pipe. They're already starting to delist different services. Or some government has got to have the balls to gut the system and start from scratch. And I don't see it happening in the near future. So it's going to be a very interesting time here in Canada in the next 20 years. Wow. Very interesting well, time. Well, hopefully the, system, the system is unsustainable. It's financially and health parameters unsustainable. Yeah, you were talking about that yesterday, some of the statistics about how some of the major diseases, despite yeah, okay. you guys having socialized medicine, have actually gone up, which is, that's a pretty cool thing. Yeah, so in the province of Ontario, again, I can't speak to the rest of the country or, or across the 49th parallel. Um, since 1970, heart disease has tripled. Cancer uh-huh. rates have gone up fourfold. Diabetes has gone up 20 times. Uh, child, childhood asthma and allergies, 50-fold increase. Childhood seizure activity, 75-fold increased. And, and Barb, Barb, don't get me started on autism. There's been a 2,500% increase in autism since 1970 in the province of Ontario. It, it is outrageous. We're spending progressively more and more money and we're getting sicker and sicker and sicker. Something has got to give because it makes absolutely no sense to continue on the way we've been going the last 50 years, let alone the last 70 years under socialized medicine. It's just unsustainable. That's crazy. Were you, were you allowed to talk about that movie Vaxxed in your practice? You can't talk about, well, you're not supposed to talk about vaccines or anything like that. Is that, is that provincial or yeah, is that... So- there oh, was a did? time when, when there was a, a gag order in the province of Ontario, but uh, cooler heads pre- prevailed uh, about four years ago uh, through some of the encouragement of the, uh, the, the, the Chiropractic Awareness Council, uh, now known as the Alliance for Chiropractic, um, where a standard of care was uh, produced that allowed us to speak of non-scope issues so long as we did not give advice. And I have no problem at all giving advice or uh, giving advice on chiropractic. But I also have no problem at all sharing information on other strategies, whether it be taking an aspirin a day, whether it be whether you get a dental amalgam or put fluoride in your water or home birth versus uh, hospital birth. I'll talk on those things, but I respect that people come through my doors enough. I would never give them advice on something that was not within my scope. For sure. Talk yes, advice no. That's right. Here's some information, Barb. Think about it. Use the God-given intelligence that's put into that skull of yours and act accordingly. Yeah. And I won't judge you either way. Your choice is your choice. It's not about me. I'm not your mother. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that's that was my approach, and that still is my approach. I just simply say, hey, if you want to check out, like, how I formed the opinions and decisions that I have and the beliefs and, and the values, you know, check out this book or read this mm-hmm. or listen to this person mm-hmm. and and see for yourself if it's a fit. I mean, the, the biggest thing that I hope that parents do when – when facing the issue of vaccines is that they study, that they're not just taking 
their doctor's word for it or my word for it for that matter, mm-hmm. but they're really spending the time, investing the time and understanding what happens when you vaccinate your child and what is truth and what is fiction. Um, yeah. And then from there, yeah. make your decision. Most, it. Most, it again? Motion. I said most folks don't look into it. They go on a motion or a belief system that whoever the uh, authority figure that told them this is the truth, they believe that that is in fact the truth. And so even when you smash them over the head with the reality, even with hard, I can show, I've shown people hard data on things and they say that might be true, but I refuse to believe it. That, right. uh, that makes sense. It's either true or it's not true. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Whether you believe it or not doesn't make the truth any less truthful. That's right. And that goes with the, the care, don't carry and never chase. Yes. I'm, and I'm with you 100% on that. I care for people, but I will not carry them. That's, I will not care more for someone than they care for themselves. Hey, Steve, what, do you, what have you found happens in practice? Like, what would you say are the telltale signs of um, a, a doctor who has overstepped in what I, what I, feel is a boundary. Care, don't carry, never chase. Like if you care more or more about somebody's health than they do, then they they can give that burden to you. If I care more about a doctor's success that I'm coaching than they do, then why should they have to care about it? Because I'm carrying it. What, what have you noticed since you've been around the profession for a long time and, and know lots of chiropractors? I'm, I'm way things? older than you. I'm way older than you. <laughs> Um, what have you found are some of the signs of somebody who um, uh, violates that boundary of care and carry? So one thing would be low PVA as far as statistics, uh, unprofitable practice, uh, burnout, stress, you know, sick docs, divorce. There's a number of things that are telltale signs that, if you know if your PVA is six, there's a good indication that you know you're not there. They're expecting you to make them better, when it's not up to me to make them better. It's up to me to help move that process along, but it's not my responsibility. Someone was in this morning and said, "Why am I not any better?" And I said, "Honestly, I don't know." I said, "Things take time." <laughs> yeah. I said, "It's not my job to tell you how long your recovery will take." And he went. Yeah. That's a good point. He just he he. As soon as I laid it out to him, being honest, I don't know how long it will take. It's not my yeah. job. And yeah. I said I don't know what your life parameters are. I don't follow you around all day. I don't know yeah. what your genetic potential is. I don't know what you do in, when you're not here. You're in my office for seven minutes a day. Yeah, I don't yeah, know yeah. What you're doing the other twenty three hours and fifty, you know, six minutes. I just don't know what you're doing. Right. He went, oh, okay, thank you. That's a good point. Yeah, I used to say to practice members when they would ask me that, I'm like. Well, you know what? Honestly, you know yourself better than I do. Like you're the one that's with yourself all day, all the time. What do you think is interfering? You're, you're living, you're living in that earth suit, not me. Yeah, and then they would always tell me, "Well, do you think it could be because I'm that 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 I'm like, well, based on what you've learned here, physical, chemical, and emotional stress, does it contribute to that? Yeah. Okay. The good question is why do you, why do you think you're not recovering as exactly. fast? Exactly. And usually exactly. they know why. They know, they know why. why. Absolutely. I agree. So any last minute um, farewells, whoa, um, or words of wisdom or funny joke, <laughs> anything you want to say at the end? Uh, no, that, you know what? I, I, this has been an enjoyable conversation, Barb. And, I, you know, if, if, if it's so moves, I would love to do it again. This is great. We covered a lot of ground. Yeah. Um, so I, I thought we would go down a couple other rabbit holes that we didn't, but that we can save that for later. <laughs> um, but I think these are just these are times when those who share a common vision for what it is that we do and what's possible from what we do, we need to stand together. Yeah, we need to we need to to support one another. We need to hang out with one another. We need to party with one another. <laughs> um, we need to be we need to be profitable. We need to make money. The you know, money is not a bad thing. The pursuit of money is the root of all evil. Money itself. Is just a measurement of energy you spend to do it with you. Mm-hmm. The person that listens to this live or is listening to it later, I, I really hope that you guys do well. I hope that you're comfortable financially so that you can continue to do what you do without fear that the, the, the bank's going to come and you know take all your equipment away tomorrow. That's just oh. far too many practitioners in that state of 
they're waiting for the, for the bank to foreclose or they're waiting for, they can't pay their next, you know, hydro bill. It's just, this got to change. That's, it's just got to change. And we need <laughs> to step up and make a change. Yeah. Uh, uh, Patrick Jen Temple says that the, uh, you know, the, the cavalry is not coming. The white knight is going to not come running, riding in on his, you know, steed and help us out. We got to look after ourselves and we got to do it together as a group. So, you know, support one another, love one another, and, and let's get this thing done. Yeah. And, you know, I, I also want to just encourage anyone, um, whether it's a bad day, maybe it's a bad week, a bad month, a bad year. I don't know. Maybe it's been a bad decade that today is a great day to mount to come back that today can be the day that you draw your line in the sand because anyone who is doing phenomenal things in their life or has done at some point in time had an, an, that line in the sand day of tomorrow, you know, and, and instead of saying tomorrow, do it today. Take one, one positive action towards the future that you want to live. Do it today and act as if you're already the success that's in your mind. Um, we're, we're here for you 100%. I know you could connect with Dr. Steve. And when you do, when you send him a Facebook message or or you go to his uh, Facebook page, make sure you read the about his um, his comments leading up to like where he went to college or where he went to chiropractic college will really give you some insight into what just an amazing guy he is. And, and just, just to let your, your viewers know and your fans know, I, I, I don't have any programs. I'm not selling things at this point in my career. So if, if you if you feel the urge to reach out, no strings attached. No strings attached. Yeah, no strings attached. Well, the heart strings, the heart strings will always yeah, be. Yeah, of course. But and you guys have a CAC event, um, well, Alliance event coming up. You want to say yeah, our uh, the, the annual spring conference, which you you've presented at in the past, yeah. uh, is April seventh, eighth, and ninth at the Toronto Airport. Uh, you just type in Alliance for Chiropractic plus Spring Con in your favorite search engine. We don't use the Google word, do we? And uh, they'll take you right to this to the page. Yeah, I'm going. So, looking forward to it. Yeah, and so Steve, will you make sure that you come back and comment on this? the the link sure. so that they can get um yeah. get connected and then if you do go make sure you like seek seek Dr. Steve out and connect up with them and and sit down and 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 have a chat for sure um there's they'll recognize that, because I'm a pretty big deal he he's kind of a big deal if you yeah. didn't know. <laughs> that's for sure all right thank you all God bless you have a wonderful day and we'll see you again soon. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Barb. Have a great day, yeah. everyone. All right. Bye-bye. We'll talk soon. Bye-bye.